So when we think about space technology, there's a thing called the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of those, and they were agreed to in 2015 by all the nations at the UN. So of those 17 Sustainable Development Goals, space technology and innovation is part of each and every one of them. You can go to the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. There's a drop-down menu that will go through each and every one of those sustainability development goals to talk about how space is helping to solve food hunger, water security, agriculture, um, health care, gender equality, um, equality education. So space is part of solving our challenges right here on planet Earth. So as we invest in space technology, we're getting those dividends back every day in healthcare. You know, one of my favorite things, does everybody have their cell phone with them? And you can all take your photo, your selfies. Just so you know, inside your cell phone is multiple forms of space technology from algorithms, but even that great photo you're gonna take of me, Captain Willie, that is from NASA imaging technology. So again, we're using space technology in ways we don't even think about. And we're just going to keep right on going, whether the slide or not, it's all going to be fine. So let's think about what's happened over the last 60 years in space. We're here to talk about career opportunities, right? Is that why we're here? Yes. All right. So let's think back 60 years ago, the Apollo era. What did the workforce look like? Well, first of all, it was a space race between two countries. It was a government workforce, primarily STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it was primarily male. So let's think about the workforce of today. So 60 years ago, two countries. Now, there are more than 90 countries operating in space, and many more that want to be a part of it. We are seeing now a diversity not only of governments, but commercial. How many of you have heard of a small little company called SpaceX? Or Blue Origin? Right, exactly. It's now become commercialized. We're seeing a diversity of the workforce. Multi-generational. Young workers and older workers, right? Older, not old, right? We want to say older. We're also seeing uh, gender equality. You know what else we're really seeing? We're seeing a diversity of the skills we need. You know, many times we think we only need STEM professionals in the space industry. And sometimes kids and people think, well, space. Space is not for me. That's for those other people. That's for STEM professionals or people who go to MIT. But you know what? Space is for all of us, and we need everyone from high school graduates to PhDs. We need program managers and policy makers and space lawyers. Who knew there were space lawyers? Space doctors, teachers, public affairs, um, strategic communication folks. Right over here at the Space Foundation booth, we've got teachers, we've got media specialists, we have strategic communications. How many of you know at NASA they have a historian and a photographer? So if you're interested in the space industry, there is an opportunity for you. So we are back to the slides and we are going to just skip right through a lot of these. And we're going to see if the video plays on some of that great space technology. Because what I learned is when you have a lot of kids, they like to have videos. So.
this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. So we kind of talked about some of that space technology you saw, the Zoom, how many of you use Zoom? Imagine what the pandemic would have been like without Zoom or telecommunications. Telecommunications is space technology. Imagine what the pandemic would have been like if kids could not have done homeschool home or we couldn't have worked from home or telemedicine with our doctor during COVID, how that has changed our lives. We talked a little bit about healthcare. We talked about those sustainable development goals. So the Space Foundation, we focus on a few of those, quality education, um, gender equality and partnerships. And here's one that I talked about, you know, food security. We can see as climate change is happening, there's space technology that is helping us benefit our lives every day. On the far uh, left-hand side of your slide are three entrepreneurs that started their business while they were still students at Qatar University majoring in nutrition. And they partnered with NASA to help take fruits and vegetables that would normally be thrown away and used that space technology called freeze-dried technology and now they created a healthy delicious snack that can now help um, eliminate food insecurity and prevent food waste. Uh, in the middle you have Dr. Catherine Nakalibi who won the African Food Prize Award in 2020 for using earth observation data to help farmers in Africa to better manage their crops, better predict whether they needed fertilizer or um, crop damage or pest control. And then on the far side, you can see that is Kennedy Space Center. That is vertical farming, because as we look to go to space, we're going to have to do vertical farming with very little or no soil, little water. But you know what? We could use that technology right here on planet Earth to help feed a hungry planet. And there are several companies that have started to commercialize this technology. We talked about water importance and finding water, and we've been using water uh, wisely on the International Space Station for over 20 years. Every drop of water on the International Space Station is recycled and reused. It goes through a filtration process, and it's tested for purity. And that same filtration process and testing is used right here on planet Earth. How many of you have been to REI? You go camping, you bring a, a bottle, and you can just scoop the water out of a lake, and you can purify your water and use it, you are using NASA technology right there, sir. And then we can look at the different types of energy that we're going to use. Um, you know, solar energy. We know, how many of you know solar panels were designed for the space program? And we're actually improving those solar panels because what we've learned is places like Mars have giant dust storms that can swallow half the planet and last for days, weeks, maybe months. And then those solar panels become covered and lose efficiency and eventually that technology, uh, those rovers have died, as we say. But they're now creating new solar panels that could be self-cleaning, that vibrate. So we're going to need those on Mars and the moon. But you know where else we could use those? Do you know some places here on Earth where there are big giant dust storms? And nobody wants to go out and clean solar panels, right? But we could put up more efficient and um, self-cleaning solar panels. We also have governments, such as the United States, that are looking to launch solar arrays into space. They will be, be launched and then assembled in space to harness the sun's energy and beam that energy energy to Earth. So just a few ways that space technology is helping us. And one more fun video.
So these are some of the major technologies that we're looking at. This came from the White House. These are also the same technologies we need in the space industry. Energy, healthcare, quantum, orbital debris, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. These are all the same technologies you see every day. If you're interested in the space industry and you're interested in these technologies, come join us. Here's what the economic sectors look like. So most people, when they hear space, they think of this space technology way over here. But space is part of each and every one of these economic sectors, agriculture, education, public safety. What would the transportation and aviation industry be without space technology providing GPS and other forms of communication? So if there's any entrepreneurs in here or you're interested in learning more about how you could become an entrepreneur and commercialize this technology, you can go to the NASA Tech Transfer Office. They have thousands of patents that are waiting to be commercialized. They also offer grants called Small Business Innovative Research Grants to help commercialize that technology. But what we really want to talk about is what are the jobs? Right? I talked about a lot of technology, but you know what every one of those pieces of technology needs? People. People. So I said we have a diversity of a workforce now, multi-generational, multi-regional. We're looking at a diversity of skill sets. I know in the aviation industry, you're, are you looking for more than pilots? Excuse me, sir, are you looking for more than pilots? We're looking for everyone. Yeah, we're looking for everyone too. So when you look at this slide, we're looking for a diversity of skill sets in the manufacturing sector. We're predicting that there's a shortfall in the manufacturing sector for space innovation jobs. Welders, electricians. And here's the great part. What's in it for, if you're thinking about yourself or your family or your children or grandchildren, space pays. Here in the United States, if you go into the space industry, it has a higher salary than non-space uh, industries. And again, I'm highlighting that diversity. We still need those STEM professionals. We still need rocket scientists and astronauts and pilots, but we also need artists and program managers and policy makers and lawyers and more. So I'm gonna stop at this point and just say, are there any questions? Because the most important thing to take away today is space is open for business. And if you're interested in any career from high school graduate to PhD, technology, innovation, cutting edge, we have a place for you in the space business. So please, we got a booth over here, Space Foundation. We'd love to talk to you. We have student field trips, but we also have adult non-accredited education. So we have entrepreneurial programs, teacher professional development. So we'd love to talk to anybody who's looking for the next step and how we're gonna build the future together. So thank you. I have one, qu one question I wanna ask you. Um, are there any learning education opportunities or part-time opportunities for older adults in space? That is a fantastic question. So what I'm going to share with you is a great story. I met this amazing woman. She was in the oil and gas industry, lived right here in Denver. And she was an executive and she left the oil and gas industry and wanted to come into the space industry. And so she started volunteering at the Space Foundation. And we said, go join Colorado Space Coalition. Go to the Colorado Business Roundtable. Come to Space Symposium. And she did all those things. And she started getting networks and contacts. And in two years, she is now the chief operating officer at a space startup company right here in Denver. So there's two good times to plant a tree. And there's two good times to join the space industry. One is 20 years ago and the other is today. So if you want to be in space, whether you're any point in your career, it's never too late, it's never too early to be in the space business, so thank you. So the Space Foundation, just so you know, is a U.S. nonprofit that does business internationally. And so we have three main divisions. We have our Symposium 365 division, our Center for Innovation and Education, and our Global Alliance. Now, Symposium 365, some of you may know, is the global premier space event 
We had that conference two weeks ago with over 14,000 of our closest friends from around the world, military, commercial, civil, and international, to talk about the future of space. And that takes place right here in Colorado, um, in Colorado Springs. That Center for Innovation and Education is all about our educational programs, workforce development and economic opportunity. And we do that through three main areas. The Space Foundation Discovery Center, our teacher professional development programs, uh, or uh, K through 12 programs, which is our leadership academy, teacher professional development, and adult non-accredited programs. So that Space Foundation Discovery Center is located in Colorado Springs, right off Garden of the Gods. And it's open to the public, so you can come by and visit us. But it's also open to student field trips. So throughout the school year, we have student field trips that come in. And we have 80 different courses that we can offer those student field trips that tie in with what a teacher is teaching in the classroom. We also do homeschool days. And we have opportunities like the summer is coming. We have a summer of discovery. So kids can come in for our summer programs. We have summer camps and space camps. Uh, so we hope that you all will consider Consider coming down to Colorado Springs, visiting our Discovery Center. We are also, Captain Willie, partnering with Denver Public Schools. So, I, yes, see, Denver Public Schools, we will be offering our Leadership Academy. So we have a Leadership Academy that is primary school, middle school, and high school, and we are offering those programs with Denver Public Schools as well as Adams 18, and we also offer them in Colorado Springs. We do teacher professional development. So for teachers in the audience, you can become one of our international teacher liaisons, and one of the benefits of that is you get to attend space symposium, and then of course, for our entrepreneurs or adults in the room, we have that uh, adult non-accredited programming that you can find both online and we do in-person programs. So thank you for asking, Willie. I appreciate it. Shelly, my question is, what do you think about having a youth symposium like this one at the same time as the space symposium? So for those of you who don't know, I always have a few highlights at Space Symposium. And so this year, we ran on the Thursday a workforce development track, which tied in with our workforce and capacity building. And we had a room full of individuals from multiple universities throughout not only Colorado, but throughout the country and the world. International Space University was also there, Emory Riddle. Uh, Metro State was there, and so we do have that at Space Symposium. We started on the Thursday, but I think there could always be opportunities to have other programs because what we've learned is the Space Foundation and Wings Over the Rockies and others, we can't do it alone. You know, the Space Foundation's superpower is connecting, and that's what we do wonderfully for the space business through symposium, bringing together those 14,000 people from around the world. But our other way to create that superpower is to bring all the capacity building providers together, both in the United States and around the world, to talk about, because you know what? The United States is not the only country that's facing a workforce shortage. The European Union, Japan, um, are having aging workforces. And so how do we do that capacity building? We're looking at the African Union. They're asking us to help create workforce. The Organization of American States, which is the countries throughout North and South America. We're looking at ISESCO, the Islamic World Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Because if we don't immerse space technology in those technologies I shared with you, we're going to leave people behind. And we need all the people we can find, inner city, rural communities, to be part of the space industry and the aviation industry. A couple more, two more, and we'll let you out of here. One here, and then her right there. He's had his hand up. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is around the slide that you had for entrepreneurs and the technologies that are available through grants would love to be able to see that, and if you can speak to that, please. This one? This one. Okay, so what this one talks about is 
um, I shared with you all that innovative technology where we need everything, you know, uh, energy and healthcare and creature comforts. Well, a lot of that has been developed already by NASA and the Air Force Research Lab and the Department of Energy. We, the United States, have thousands of patents that are waiting to be commercialized. And it just takes someone to say, I'm going to go look at that website, I'm going to look at that technology, and I'm going to apply for that patent and a grant to maybe get it. And so this is a treasure trove for the United States. But you know what? It's not just the United States. The European Space Agency has a tech transfer office. Japan has a tech transfer office. So we need to take that technology that our governments has, have invested in and commercialize that to benefit life here on Earth. Um, so here's a story. A former NFL player took one of those NASA technologies that's on, you know, Fitbit type of health monitoring things, commercialized it, NASA helped it, helped him, he brought it to market, an NFL player. I have another woman named Dr. Nicole Wagner. She did not take a NASA technology, but during her research um, and getting her PhD, she looked at a disease called macular degeneration. Does anybody know about that? That causes blindness as we get older and there's no cure. She is looking at 3D printing lens replacements on the International Space Station, and she's working not only with the FDA, but with NASA to do that and SpaceX, so that in hopefully five years or so, we will be able to give people back their sight. So NASA is a great resource. They want to help. They have the tech transfer. But even if you come up with your own idea, NASA is a resource to help you make it happen. Thank you. We have one more, one madam, more. from this lady right here. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was, I'm going to talk to Karen. Oh, okay. Didn't do that right. All right, that's it then. We're done. Thank you so Thank much. You so much.